Medical disease is hard enough to control in the non-pregnant patient. This lecture is going to serve as a review from a lot of the information that you'll get in the medicine videos as it pertains to obstetrics. The problem is that a lot of the medications you'd like to use or that are commonly used to control medical disease in the non-pregnant patient are generally teratogenic and are not indicated for use in pregnant patients. So we're going to go, this is sort of a hodgepodge lecture. If you've already watched the medicine videos, this will be a nice review. If you haven't seen them yet and you're just studying for OB, this will be an introduction to medical disease as well. So let's start off with the urinary tract infection. And the difference between the pregnant and non-pregnant patients is that you are going to do asymptomatic screening of a pregnant patient. Otherwise, UTIs are going to be essentially the same in the pregnant patient as they are in the non-pregnant patient, except for some medication changes. So you will present either as an asymptomatic screen or urgency, frequency, and dysuria, the common symptoms of urinary tract infection, or if it is higher in her urinary tract, it will present as a pyelonephritis with urgency, frequency, dysuria, fever and chills, and costovertebral angle tenderness. Regardless, you're going to do the same simple test for every condition. And that is you're going to get a urinalysis and a urine culture. So if the patient only had a positive urine, and a positive urine means leukocyte esterase, nitrates, positive bacteria, and negative squamous cells, positive UA, but no symptoms. This was an asymptomatic bacteriuria. There's bacteria in the urine, but mom doesn't even know. The thing is that in normal patients who are not pregnant, you do not screen and you do not treat asymptomatic bacteriuria. But in a pregnant patient, this bacteria may get into the, va the vagina and then up to baby. So you do want to treat. Your normal options for treating UTIs are nitrofurantoin, Bactrim and Cipro. The problem is that Bactrim and Cipro are not used in pregnancy. So you're really only left with nitrofurantoin. You can also use ceftriaxone if the organism comes back resistant to nitrofurantoin. And in general, you are not going to test for resolution. But in pregnant patients, you are going to rescreen. And if on rescreen she is positive again, you're simply going to repeat the process with your analysis and your culture and treat her again. If you've eradicated the bug and the rescreen is negative, the condition is resolved and you go back to the normal screening patterns. This is for asymptomatic bacteriuria. This is really how UTIs differ from normal medical patients to patients who are pregnant. But if you've got a positive UA and you've got positive symptoms, then you just had a UTI. And as we just learned, you only really have two options, nitrofurantoin and ceftriaxone. On the other hand, if she had a positive urinalysis, positive symptoms, and casts, that is white blood cell casts on the urinalysis, now you're worried about pyelo. Not every patient with pyelo needs to be admitted, but every patient who is pregnant with pyelo should be admitted and started on Piptazo, Zosin, because you want to monitor her. You want to see if she gets better. You're going to reassess her daily. And after two days, if she has improved, and of course by now, cultures and sensitivities will have come back, all she had was pyelo. And she needs to be treated with antibiotics based on cultures and sensitivities for 7 to 14 days. If, however, after two days she has not improved, the fevers and chills are still pregnant, she still has a leukocytosis, now she may have an abscess. And to identify the abscess, you can either use a CT scan or an ultrasound. 
but she's pregnant. So you have to do the ultrasound only to identify the abscess and then get in there and drain it. So remember, no CT scans, no teratogenic antibiotics. The antibiotics you're gonna choose are nitro, ceftriaxone, or if she's got suspected pilo, piptazo. And remember that pyelonephritis is systemic disease and you should get blood cultures to make sure the bacteria doesn't have access to baby. As we go through the rest of these medical diseases, they're gonna be each one isolated into itself. It's gonna be a systematic review of all the medicine lectures that, you've, you, that you have access to in the medicine section. The first one is hypertension. Now this is hypertension in someone who has hypertension before they get pregnant. This is not gestational hypertension. This is not a worry for eclampsia. This is chronic hypertension that exists before they get pregnant. When they get pregnant, the goals are the same. If they have no other comorbid condition, their blood pressure goal is less than 140 over less than 90. If they do have comorbid condition, the goal will be lower. The problem is you only have very few medications to use. Alpha-methyl-dopa is sort of the quintessential medication used during pregnancy, but it is in the same class as hydralazine and metoprolol. Any combination of these medications are safe and will generally be based on comorbidities. But the problem is the medications you reflexively use, the ones that are better to use in non-pregnant patients, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, diuretics like hydrochlorothiazide, and calcium channel blockers are all contraindicated in the pregnant patient. So you have to use the ones you may not go to very often, and you must resist the temptation to go to the reflex medications to control blood pressure because they are teratogenic. Usually going hand in hand with hypertension is diabetes. And again, this is not gestational diabetes. This is the diabetes that someone has before they get pregnant. There's type 1 diabetics and type 2 diabetics. Type 1 diabetics are a product of autoimmune destruction of the pancreas. This happens very early in childhood, and so you'll know they're a diabetic beforehand that only responds to insulin. The type 2 diabetics are from insulin insensitivity. They're so obese, their pancreas constantly turns, turns out insulin until the pancreas burns out. The patient is generally going to be obese if they're type 2, and thin if they're type 1, and you're going to look for polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia. Obese if it's type 2, thin if they're type 1. Now, in order to diagnose diabetes, there's a couple of ways you can do it. And we're talking about non-gestational diabetes. Either you have a random glucose greater than 200. One time, random glu glucose greater than 200, diabetes. A fasting glucose greater than 125 on two separate occasions. You can use the hemoglobin A1C now. If that's greater than 7%, diabetes. But if the patient doesn't necessarily meet these criteria, say the fasting glucose is greater than 100 but less than 125, they're said to have impaired glucose tolerance. And then you'll want to do the two-hour glucose tolerance test, where after two hours after a glucose load, if they're greater than 200, they're diagnosed with diabetes. Now, there are a lot more details that go into this, and the, those details can be found in two separate lectures about diabetes in the endocrine section. I just want to give you the rundown and sort of the highlights of non-gestational diabetes testing. And I'm also going to compare them right now to gestational. Because a lot of OBs are going to deal with gestational diabetes, not very many will deal with non-gestational. And so to diagnose gestational diabetes, and you'll see this later on in obstetrics complications, you're going to use the one hour glucose tolerance test. And if that's positive, follow it up with a three hour glucose tolerance test. And I say that because I don't want you to confuse it with the two-hour glucose tolerance test of non-gestational diabetes. And finally, in the diabetes management, you're going to use insulins only. 
you're not going to use any oral anti-hyperglycemic. And the insulin regimen you're going to use is basal bolus, QHS, QAC. Check out managing diabetes in the endocrine section. We're going to move on to start talking about thyroid disease. And the problem with thyroid disease is that too much is bad and too little is bad. If you are hyperthyroid, you can burn up baby. Baby will die. But if you're hypothyroid, baby will come to term, but it'll have cretinism, severe mental retardation. And the patient you'll have to identify as hyper or hypothyroid. And in general, hyperthyroid patients have everything elevated, while hypothyroid have everything depressed. When I say everything, T4 drives mentation, metabolism, and movement. So when the patient is hyperthyroid, they're going to have tachycardia. They're going to be burning energy. They're going to be hot when everyone else is cold. They'll have weight loss, diarrhea, maybe even AFib. When they're hypothyroid, everything's moving slower. They're going to be slower to think. They're going to be cold when everyone else is hot. They're going to have weight gain and constipation, bradycardia. If you identify either hyper or hypothyroidism, you're going to screen with a TSH. In hyperthyroidism, you have an excess of T4. T4 then will feed back and turn off TSH. So you screen for hyperthyroidism with a TSH. In hyperthyroid, the TSH is low. In hypothyroidism, the T4 is low, and so TSH is uninhibited. You screen for hypothyroidism with a TSH. In hypothyroidism, the TSH is elevated. In normal progression, and you can check this out in the endocrine thyroid lectures, in hyperthyroidism, you normally will do a RIU scan to determine the cause of hyperthyroid. But a radioactive iodine is generally not a good idea for baby. So if she doesn't already have a diagnosis of hyperthyroid, do not perform a RIU scan in a pregnant female. To treat, hyperthyroid tends to have a lot of options. But the only one that's safe is PTU, safe in pregnancy. PTU is safe in pregnancy. And if you're going to do surgery, it should be done in the second trimester. That is, after the fetus is developed, but before mom's belly is so big it compromises her respiratory status. And most of hyperthyroidism responds to iodine ablation. But if you've got a fetus who also has a thyroid, you do not want to ablate that thyroid also. So you cannot use iodine ablation in a pregnant female. Hypothyroidism is simply treated with what she doesn't have. She doesn't have T4, so give her T4. Give her levothyroxine, Synthroid. Give her what she doesn't have. Give her T4. And you're going to follow up using the TSH. Once they are on th levothyroxine, you can't use T4 anymore. Once they're being treated for hyperthyroidism, you can't use the T4 anymore. You should track only with the TSH. The next disease we're going to talk about is seizures. And here's the big problem with seizure disorder. Essentially, all anti-seizure medications are teratogens. And the patient is going to have a history of epilepsy. She'll have seizures. And you're going to know about this ahead of time or you're going to see her seize. Now, if you see seizures in a pregnant patient, you should first think of eclampsia. But if you know she's got a history of seizure disorder and it's early on in the pregnancy, it's probably just her seizure disorder acting up. The problem is that you may actually want to counsel her not to get pregnant. The balance you have to have here is, is treating mom healthy for baby? And in the case of seizures, usually the answer is no. That is, the treatment for seizures that will keep mom healthy to keep baby healthy are actually unhealthy for baby. But at the same time, if you don't treat mom's seizures and she seizes, she could lose the baby that way as well. So these patients maybe want to be counseled against getting pregnant. But if they do get pregnant and they do seize, use phenobarbital. Phenobarbital in pregnancy. 
and make sure the patient uses folate throughout her pregnancy if she's going to be on phenobarb. Phenobarb is really good at aborting those seizures. It's very difficult to use phenobarb for nine months while the, while the fetus develops. So seizure disorder, consider not getting pregnant. Consider these patients highest risk. And we're going to close with a disease that is unique to obstetrics, and that is hyperemesis gravidarum. You encountered hyperemesis gravidarum in the GYN lectures during discussions about moles. And we're not really sure what causes hyperemesis gravidarum. It's probably the beta HCG, which is why you get it with moles, but it might be from estradiol. We're not really sure why it happens. But the patient is going to present with morning sickness. But it's a really bad morning sickness that lasts into the second trimester. Morning sickness should have get better by the first trimester. But it's so bad, and it's not just nausea and vomiting, it's nausea and vomiting so bad that it causes volume depletion. Nausea and vomiting so bad that it actually causes starvation. And you'll see ketones in the blood. Again, nausea and vomiting so bad that it causes volume depletion, starvation, and weight loss. So this is like a really super bad morning sickness. And what you do for a patient with hyperemesis gravidarum is simply make sure it's not a mole. So you're going to get a beta HCG to make sure it's an appropriate level. Remember, moles present with mega high beta HCGs, and get an ultrasound to make sure there's no snowstorm. What you're doing is ruling out a mole. And once you've ruled out mole, you just have to tell her, sorry, you're one of those unfortunate patients who have really bad morning sickness. The therapy you're going to give her is to support her give her intravenous fluids as needed, and then you're going to try to take away the nausea. Now, not all antiemetics are useful or usable in pregnancy. And generally, I want you to follow this escalating technique for patients who are pregnant and have nausea. That is, they have hyperemesis gravidarum, or they're simply in the hospital for another reason and are suffering with nausea. Begin with oxylamine. Step it up to promethazine, then metoclopramide, and finally omdansetron. Use this in an escalating fashion. Start with doxylamine and eventually get up to Zofran on Dancitron if they need extra coverage. Okay, so this is just a hodgepodge of medical disease. You, you can find more details about all of these diseases in their corresponding section in the medical lectures. This lecture had a little twist that added in the OB component. Recognize that most of these diseases are controllable, with the exception of seizures. You just have to know which medications are safe to use in pregnancy and which ones aren't. The caveat is, if you have an asymptomatic bacteriuria, you do not treat or rescreen a healthy patient, which you do treat and rescreen a patient who is pregnant. That is medical disease. We make these videos for free, and we need your help. Please donate, because without your donations, we can't make any more videos. Please donate.